Hello, everybody. My name is Julian Thetford. I am a senior TV and film major, playwriting minor from Chicago, Illinois. I attend the illustrious Howard University. Um, I'm joined here today by the one and only James Grant. What's up, Julian? I'm doing well, man. That's good. It's good. I'm happy that you're here today. I'm happy you know we yeah, get a chance yeah. to chop it up real quick. So um, I'm just gonna jump right into it. Your series is Emmy Award winning. You've um received multiple awards for Best Lead Actor. Um, you've done this all in such a short time, and you know that's definitely required a lot of focus and hard work. So I'm curious, kind of, to just rewind it back for a second. I'm, I'm curious to know when did this love and passion for filmmaking kind of come from? Yeah, man, it really started for me in uh, in high school. Uh, uh, you can't tell because we're on the Zoom, but I'm actually 6'6", right? I'm a tall guy. <laughs> and so most of my life, I was pushed towards sports and basketball, but uh, I was able to kind of explore my uh, creative aspirations through doing plays, you know, in church. Uh, and it was something I've always enjoyed. Um, I've always been a, a poet and a writer and just kind of enjoyed expressing myself creatively. Um, and so I got my feet wet doing church plays. Um, then eventually I saw playing basketball when I went to college and it kind of freed up my space and my time to really figure out what else I wanted to do, um, you know, with my free time. And uh, I stumbled into, you know, filmmaking. I started going over to Florida State and auditioning for student films and then got bit by the bug and then realized that I just didn't want to be in front of the camera, but I also wanted to write and direct and just kind of create my own projects. And so um, I met Will Packer my junior year of college, and he was promoting Stump the Yard at the time. And I told him I wanted to be a filmmaker. And he asked me if I had ever made a film. I was like, nah, <laughs> never made a film. And so he said, go make a film and then come talk to me. So I spent my, my senior year writing and directing and producing my first film. Uh, and I had the opportunity to premiere it in Lee Hall Auditorium on the campus of the Florida Agricultural and Mechanical University. And uh, it was that experience of seeing my work on a big screen with an audience that really kind of solidified my desire to be a filmmaker. I know so far I'm in your career, I'm, I'm sure you've experienced, you know, a lot of ups and downs. Um, you know, I'm a filmmaker myself and I know already I haven't been doing it too long, but it's, it's a roller coaster, man. So I'm wondering yeah. if you can kind of give us some insight, you know, what do you do on those days, you know, where you're not feeling up to the task, where things are a little bit harder? Bro, I had one of those days today. <laughs> well, here you go. Here you, you, go. Know, <laughs> you know, it's just perseverance, uh, tenacity, above all tenacity. I think it's important to, to take a break, to take a pause, um, and then to just pick it right back up. You know, don't allow yourself to stay down, you know, for too long. And I think it's also important to remember your why. Like, remember why you started. Remember why you're doing it. Uh, remember that the praise is temporary and that art is subjective. You know what I'm saying? So this isn't yeah, like yeah. A, a sport where there's a clear winner. Like we're out here creating for uh, A, ourselves, you know, first, like you gotta know that I'm making this because this is how I express myself. But in addition, there's somebody who's gonna find what I'm putting out into the world beneficial. And so I think, you know, on those tough days, if you can just remind yourself, why am I doing this? Um, I think, you know, you'll kind of, get the uh the inspiration you need to get back going you know you do talk about a why what is what is your why oh what is my why you yeah, know I, I i feel like uh you know i make films because um television and, and, and film and just media as a whole is uh the way we uh or people kind of know that their existence is is relevant um, I think it has the ability, you know, to inspire people. Uh, growing up, people often said or told me I was going to be a preacher because I like to, I like to talk. You know what I'm saying? I like to inspire people. Well, I didn't want to inspire people from the pulpit. And then I found filmmaking, and I realized that these moving images on screen had the ability to, like, really inspire and uplift people. And I was like, oh, okay, and that's what I'm going to do with my life. At what point? Did you kind of make that decision to move out to LA? Decided, so I graduated from FAMU with, I studied business uh, and knew that I wanted to make films and that I wanted to be an actor, writer, director, to do all of the things. And so, you know, when you graduate, everybody's like, what's next? You going to grad school, you got a job. I didn't have none of those things. So I just started telling people I'm moving to LA. I didn't have a job, bro. I didn't have a, I didn't have a car. I didn't 
I didn't have no place to stay. <laughs> I was just like, yo, I'm moving to LA when I, when I get out of here. And I stuck to that. So I ended up, you know, finding a place, uh, a one bedroom apartment to sublet and um, just made the move, took the leap of faith. And I would say uh, two weeks of being in LA, I got a call from Will Packer to come and be an intern on one of his films. So it worked out. How much did you feel like mentorship? Is that something that you sought out, uh, getting a mentor or somebody to kind of guide you, show you the ropes? Yeah, for sure, man. I was definitely looking for mentors. I'll be honest and say it wasn't easy to find. Um, I think a lot of the folks I was reaching out to were just too busy. And reaching back to the next generation of talent wasn't really a priority for them. But, you know, it's interesting. I've had a lot of mentors who don't know they were mentoring me. Like I was able to find mentorship through uh, just learning about the journey of other people. So I would watch a lot of interviews on YouTube. I would read up on just other filmmakers and artists. And in a lot of ways, I was getting mentored through the journey of other artists that I looked up to, even though they weren't like directly, uh, you know, speaking to me. <laughs> but of course I had like a handful of older folks who were already in LA, who were in the industry, who were helping to guide me. but um i think mentorship is incredibly important and it's why i try to do things like this it's why i work with like hbcu in la because you know i want to be the thing that i didn't have and i recognize how important a mentor can be in terms of shaping and guiding the career of a young person right um so i know you kind of just brushed on briefly kind of the hbcu in la connection um i, yeah. I know that's something myself and a lot of other uh, hbcu students are really familiar with would you mind diving a little bit deeper into uh, kind of just sharing with us what you do with them? Yeah, man. So, you know, HBCU in LA is a program where HBCU students from across the country get the opportunity to come to Los Angeles and intern um, with, with various companies, whether it's the agency side from like CAA to UTA to WME, or if it's the production side, network side, BT, Bad Robot, Monkey Paul. Um, they get to live in Los Angeles for the entire summer, but where I come in is I came in and I uh, actually spearheaded and started the initiative where they get to actually make a film, you know, while they're here in Los Angeles. And so I work with the students to write, uh, direct and produce, you know, a short film over a course of a weekend. And so, you know, students get the opportunity to pitch an idea. Uh, the winning idea then turns into a script and then we choose a director, you know, producers, you know, students get to audition to then be in the film and we produce it with the support of industry mentors. So actual folks working in the industry. Um, and then also a lot of organizations, you know, support the program. So we get like cameras from Panavision. And so you got these students literally making a film on cameras that cost like a hundred thousand dollars, you know, or working with a, a director of photography who's, you know, Emmy Award winning. Um, so it's a really great program. And then you get to walk away with a pilot short film that you can add to your portfolio, you know, to your resume, and you kind of got that leg up. You got that foot in the door. You got a calling card that you can show off. So it's a really cool program. Now, I know, like, outside of HBC in LA, I've seen you done a lot of other mentor work as well. Um, would you mind kind of sharing any of that with us? Yeah, another organization is the Nate Parker Film Institute. Um, and so for any aspiring filmmakers, um, it's another really great organization that you can apply. And very similar where you get to uh, go to Wiley College for an entire week and you go through a series of workshops. You talk to different mentors. You learn about A, yourself first. You learn about your Blackness. You learn about your history. You learn about the importance of art as activism. And then you go through like directing workshops, writing workshops, producing workshops, acting workshops with like casting director Twinkie Bird. Um, and then finally you make a film. Um, and then the film is premiered uh, on the Sunday before you go home. And then also the program partners with the Pan-African Film Festival where those students get to come to Los Angeles and they get to premiere the film that they made in front of an audience of often industry professionals and just folks here in LA who are into filmmaking. All right, now I can't have James Bland on the call and not talk about Giants. So I'm curious to know, you know, how did, how did, when did, when did this begin? When did this whole journey around and surrounding this show from its curation to the time you were writing it to the time you were like, you know what, it's time to take that leap of faith and make it. Can you kind of yeah. give us the rundown on that? Yeah, man, so Giants started, uh, 
the years start to run together. Um, I'll just say, I can't remember what year it was, but I was at a place in my career where I was um, coming off of working on a bunch of other folks' projects. Like I had spent like five years directing or just kind of acting in or producing projects that weren't my own. Um, and so I hadn't really created anything that was from like my brain or from my heart. And I just felt like it was time to do that. And so, you know, I sat down and wrote Giants, wrote every episode, you know, myself, you know, the first season, produced it, starred in it, paid for it out of pocket, worked a full-time job while doing it. But uh, Giants, you know, uh, served two purposes for, for me. Hey, I just wanted to create a gym for myself to work out, you know, as an artist to write, direct, you know, act. And then secondly, I wanted to create something that said, yo, this is my voice as an artist. This is what I have to say. These are the types of images and characters that I want to see on screen. And so, uh, you know, this is my art and it found his audience. And then, you know, season two, it expanded. We got a writer's room, uh, brought on more directors. It just became like a bigger production and a bigger show. And then uh, we were able to uh, get it on Clio TV, which is a broadcast network. And then, you know, BET Plus. I think a lot of people outside of, you know, the TV and film world, production world, they're not really familiar, you know, with how frequently things go wrong on set. Um, so I'm curious to know yeah. in that first season, like what was like the biggest thing that kind of just went disaster? By far, I know you. I, I know you gotta have. Okay. Me. Yeah, for sure. So it's uh, episode was it five when Malachi he gets robbed at gunpoint. Yeah. So we never had a permit when shooting giants, and so you know typically when you're shooting, let's say any exteriors, if you're shooting on the street, if you're shooting in a public place, you're supposed to get a permit. The permits cost money. <laughs> we were on a budget. And so we would, what we call, uh, you know, guerrilla filmmaking, we would steal every shot. Basically, we would just roll up, pull our cameras out. We would shoot until somebody said we couldn't be, you know, in a, in a, a location. So uh, we were in this like public place and the security guard came out and was like, you guys got to bounce. The hard thing about that was we had already started shooting the scene. We were in the middle of it. And so we would lose the entire day um, and all of this footage, we wouldn't be able to cut the scene together if we weren't able to finish it. And so we started telling all types of lies. We're like, we're, uh, we're a student project. This is for my thesis film. I need this to graduate. Just trying to just plead with the security guard, hoping he would uh, just allow us to stay. But he was like, nah, I got to go. So we was like, damn. Uh, uh, and, and so what we ended up doing was we kind of moved, uh, I would say, I don't know, like a, a hundred feet from where we were, where we were at least off of the property of the, the people who said we had to go, but our background was still the same. And so we were able to just shoot in tight shots and have our background be a little blurred out. So you really couldn't tell that we were in a different, uh, kind of a different place than where we started because the surroundings still felt the same. And we were able to finish the scene. Yeah, and that's that crazy. Was, uh, one thing almost went disastrous season one, but we were able to you know, make it work. <laughs> No, it's crazy because I was watching that scene and I was like, man, they did this scene really well, especially for having a gun in there. And I could tell that, you know, it wasn't one of those situations where you guys yeah. had the location pre-made for you. So I definitely yeah. admired that scene. It's crazy to hear that, you know, it wasn't even secure. Like it, it was yeah, <laughs> things were going wrong. So was there any like specifically, uh, you know, things that came up surrounding the gun? Uh, I know that's typically- uh, it, was a, it, was a, it was a prop gun. You know, the thing that you always got to be careful about is I mean, we're African-Americans, uh, although we're shooting a project, we're shooting a, a TV show that the average white person rolling by <laughs> ain't gonna just think, oh, they're shooting a TV show, even though you see cameras and lights. And so we were very sensitive around how often we actually had the gun out and pointed because we didn't want any issues of, you know, somebody calling the cops and the cops rolling up, not taking the time to actually uh, assess the situation and realizing that it's a fake gun that we're actually shooting a TV show. So I would say it was, we were a little nervous, you know, with that because you just don't know. But in terms of as actors, it was a complete prop gun. It was actually, um, it was kind of like, uh, like basically plastic, you know? Yeah, yeah. Uh, and so we knew we were, we were good, we were safe, but we knew that folks uh, watching us or driving by because we were in a public place with no permits that they wouldn't know what was going on, so. Yeah, I asked that, that question, man. Personally, I've had an experience just like that where we were shooting something right. with a fake gun 
And yeah. somebody came up. He was like, what you guys doing with the gun? I'm a police uh-huh. officer, blah, blah, blah. He called the cops. <laughs> all those bunch of cops came up. We're shooting on my property, mind you. So it was exactly. pretty crazy. So I had, I had to ask. Um, yeah, man. So I guess, so, you know, that's one thing we got to tell, you know, filmmakers. You got to be really careful because we got a different set of rules and circumstances for us. And so uh, although you want your film to be realistic and believable, we have to think twice when we're shooting projects that involve, you know, guns or police officers or anything like that. Right, right, most definitely. And then yeah. I guess moving into season two of Giants, um, what was kind of that big leap? Because I'm sure you had a lot more traction coming into season two. You had a lot more money, hopefully, and um, you just had a lot more people vying for you and willing to work with you. Um, so what was kind of the benefit to, you know, that second season compared to the first one? What do you feel like was the biggest difference? Yeah, I think, A, uh, just experience. I had more, uh, I had season one under my belt and I was able to watch the first season and learn from my own mistakes and really be able to see what translates from script to screen and kind of what not to do, what to avoid. Um, And then I brought on a team, man. And I always say filmmaking is a team sport. And the the more team play, team members you have, I think you're gonna make the better project. And so the fact that I was able to bring in, you know, writers and other directors, I think only improved, you know, the show. And it wasn't just all on my shoulders. And we were all able to collaborate together, it just made it better. Um, and uh, and then also we had a bigger audience, and so we were also able to raise more money, you know, for it because we were able to go to um, brands and say, hey, let's do some product placement because we are on Issa Rae's YouTube channel. We have a viewing audience, we have the numbers to back it up. And so it just, you know, allowed us to do a lot more from locations to, you know, getting background. People were willing to like come out and be extras in like a club scene, like in episode uh, 203, uh, because season one existed, people were aware of it, they were fans of it and they wanted to be a part of it. Yeah, no, I, I definitely noticed the um the boost in terms of just the yeah, extra the product, yeah, product placement, the production value. Yeah, that one scene. Um, I think it was in season two, episode two, uh, with mm-hmm. Walgreens. Um, and oh, yeah, Walgreens. Yeah. yeah, did they um have like a connection with you? Did something there happen? Was a partnership. Like, yeah, we actually partnered with Walgreens, and they allowed us to shoot you know, inside of that store because Walgreens is all about um like one of their brand initiatives revolves around like uh, wellness within a community. And because Journey was in therapy in that episode, we were able to kind of tie Walgreens into it and in saying that we were promoting mental health, uh, in particular to people of color, to minority women. And, you know, that was an audience that Walgreens wanted to reach. And so that's how we were able to get them to partner. Very similar to like the reason a day um, goes to the clinic to get an HIV test. We partnered with the AIDS Healthcare Foundation so there are a lot of organizations that, that filmmakers can, can partner with who are trying to reach a particular demographic. And if you can say, hey, we're going to talk about this particular social issue within our, um, our episode, within our film, oftentimes they'll partner and they'll give you money uh, to either showcase their brand or to have certain conversations. Season two, you all had some real locations. I think season one, it was a lot more in the house, we're on the street. Yeah. But come season two, you all at Walgreens, you in the club. I'm yeah. like, man, I, I know for sure that you guys had a boost in, um, you know, negotiations yeah, yeah. and all that. So it was definitely great to see. Um, so nah, yeah, let's um, let's let's talk to Emmys. Like, what was that experience let's like? Go. That's, that's crazy, I, man. The Emmys was a good time. It was um, uh. You know, season one, we got two nominations, which was cool. You know, Vanessa and I went. And then, you know, season, no, that was season one. So then season two, I think we had, what, 11? Um, So it was just a different experience being able to go with your tribe and experience this award show with the folks who really worked really hard to help make this whole thing happen. And then just to be honest, ain't many folks that look like us up in there. You know what I'm saying? So we was representing for the young black folks. and so it was, it was an honor, man, to particular for a show that started in my kitchen and in my living room to then go to the stage of the daytime Emmys. I felt like it really represented the possibilities uh, or just what's possible, you know, how you can start from, from nothing, literally from the bottom and, you know, ascend to those types of levels. Yeah, it was dope. You know, I think, you know, the big thing about seeing you at the Emmys, at least, was it showed that 
you know, we can, we can, you can, you can just start something yourself. You don't, you don't need somebody else to come in and help. You can really come up with an idea in your head and then end up on an Emmy stage. If you have the determination, you have the time and the commitment. So I would like Absolutely. to thank you personally for, you know, just your contributions and, and achieving that. Cause it, it's really huge. It really is. Thanks man. Thank you. There's been a lot of conversation recently around kind of just giving black creators the credit that they deserve. Uh, do you do you have any say on this? Any anything you'd like to to kind of? I mean, give us our things. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> um, I feel like, yeah, I feel like it's an ongoing conversation that is constantly happening in our industry in particular, and you know the contributions that black artists make, and we don't often get uh the recognition when it comes to award shows we don't get the recognition when it comes to pay we don't also get the recognition in terms of the number of projects being greenlit but i also think that this is the best time to be a black content creator in hollywood in terms of when you look at the amount of shows and the amount of just young black um artists that are that are working and to be a working artist alone is a blessing and so it's like that thing, we, it's, it feels like we, we always have far to go in this country. Um, and not just in the entertainment industry, but I think just overall, uh, we just got a long way to go. But I think there are just a lot of folks who are shaking the table, who are breaking ceilings and who are opening doors. And for all the students who are aspiring, uh, I think it's a great time because there's a, there's a, there's a trail that's been blazed. Um, yeah. Uh, let me ask you do, you, do you recognize your place in that? Yeah, you kind of do, man. Into? Yeah, absolutely. I absolutely do. And in particular in the digital space, and I took, particularly when I look at Giants and, um, and you know, Issa Rae uh, opened up so many doors with what she did with Aqua Black Girl, but I know that Giants kind of stepped in and was in a lane all its own because not many not many independent series can say that it started out on YouTube and then was able to, that same content, like those same episodes that were on YouTube were then licensed to, you know, a cable network and you can now watch it on Clio TV or you can now watch it on a, on a streamer, you know, on BET Plus. And so uh, I know for a lot of people, a lot of, it gave a lot of filmmakers hope that I can make something, it could be indie, you know, I don't need a studio um, or a big budget to be able to, uh, you know, get on the platform to find a significant audience. So, yeah, I definitely recognize the path that Giants has, has blazed, man. Yeah, yeah, I think you, you're definitely, in a lot of ways, kind of this, this new poster child for, you know, getting it out the mud, if you will. Yeah, uh, yeah. When it comes to really just just going and getting it, I think you kind of yeah. you and you and Isa both blazed the way. And I think when people think about that, they think of YouTube. Um, so, so, yeah. yeah. What do you think we can do as Black creators to kind of ensure that our rip our, our work is not ripped off or or stolen from us? You know, I think um, I, um, I mean, you can always copyright. You know, your content. You can go through the Library of Congress. And so if you write a script, uh, you can register it with the WGA. And so there's some form of a copyright on it. And I think the other thing is, uh, it's really tough, man, because um, I was gonna say, you know, making sure your content uh, is produced and, and is out. Uh, that's a tough question. I just gotta say that's a tough one because I, I've seen it. I've seen it even from beyond filmmakers, but just like designers, uh, black designers who, who make something and then these bigger brands come in and just copy it. Um, and so I really don't know how to get around that. Um, I think you just gotta continue to create, continue to put things out and just know that at the end of the day, we're the trendsetters. Um, we're the ones typically setting the trends. And so just keep just doing your thing and I just hope for the best and don't worry too much about that because you know it'll slow you down. What advice would you give to a college student or young professionals who look up to you um, in your career and what you've been able to accomplish? Yeah, you know, I would say the best piece of advice I can probably give is just do the work. You know, I think oftentimes when you you aspire to be a filmmaker, uh, you want the like the accolades. 
Um, you want uh, you want to start out kind of already in a place where you got the agent, you got the manager. Everybody wants to pop. You know what I mean? Everybody wants to be on. Everybody wants the blue checks and the followers. Um, and those things will come, you know, with time. But and I think the way they come is just focusing on the work. Um, there's a quote that says it has and always will be about the work because uh, the praise is temporary. You know what I mean? And know that the criticisms will come. It's like uh, the saying that says the spotlight burns. And so I know everyone is so anxious to be in the spotlight, but without taking into consideration uh, the pressure, you know, that yeah. comes with that. And so, uh, but if you can just focus on the work and just uh, allow it to always be about the work, you'll find yourself uh, just receiving more opportunities. I feel like a lot of folks try to focus a lot of their time on networking. Like they want to be in the right place. They want to meet the right people, but good works has less. And so if you do good work, like people will find you, people will come to you. You know what I mean? So we were talking about, you know, the sudden success of giants um, in your personal life. Did you feel like there was a sudden uptick um, just with suddenly getting a lot of notoriety? Like did people recognize you on the street every yeah, man, it, it blows my mind. Like, I would tell you it's probably one of the most humbling things that happens for me. Um, in particular, when the show was um, initially coming out on Easter Ray's YouTube channel, I would get sometimes recognized in the airport um, or just out and about. Um, in particular, more on the East Coast, like less in LA. I don't know if, if it's because LA, you know, folks are used to seeing people like actors and, you know, shit like that. But when I would come to the East Coast, when I come to DC, if I, even New York, when I'll be in Florida, oftentimes people would uh, recognize me from the show. And it's the most humbling thing because sometimes I, I still just look at it as this little thing that I created. And so it still blows my mind that it's gone as far as it has. But um, yeah, I, I give a lot of credit to Issa Rae. She built that, uh, she built a platform with the misadventures of Aqua Black Girl and it gave us such a really great launching pad. And it gave us a built-in audience where there was an audience that was hungry for independent content from black, you know, content creators. And so um, it was just, it was dope. It's been dope. We see in your, in the series, a lot of different, like, just very, very talented black individuals. Um, yeah. And I, I was always the people in the series um, that I, I had seen like on social media, like years prior. Um, I remember when Vine was big, you have a rapper that goes by the name of Chief Law Kill uh, yeah. in, in yeah. your series. Uh, when did you when did you get to know all these people? When did you connect with them? And how did that kind of um, form when it was time for you to shoot your show? Did you know that these were people that you wanted in there? Yeah, man, I, we always say like Black Hollywood is really small. I've been in LA for now, shit, going on like 13 years. And so a lot of these people were just folks you came up with. Like the folks who are popping today were people that, you was uh, riding a bus with yesterday, you know? <laughs> and so I think that's the thing. Like most of the folks who are, in, who are in Giants were my peers, were my friends, were people that I knew from church and people that I knew from like working on another project together. Like for example, Keen Batch, even though he's not in Giants, like Keen Batch was in my first web series. You know, KJ Smith, who's now on Sisters on BET and doing a lot of stuff. KJ and I used to be roommates. Like we went to FAMU together. Um, you know, Terrence Terrell, who play, played Quasi, like prior to, I had met Terrence like years ago, and now he's on like Be Positive on CBS. And so um, I think that's the cool thing about LA is that pe the people who stick around eventually meet their opportunity. And so you'll find that a lot of your, your friends might be folks who are on television or who are, who are, you know, doing different films, like Will Catlett, who is in Black Lightning, he was in Love Is, like Will is doing really great right now. But I met Will when he was on Black and Sexy TV. You know, when he was just doing web series, when he only had maybe one television credit to his name as like a, a as like a co-star, you know what I mean? Yeah. Um, but, uh, but yeah, you just kind of grow. You grow up with people and you find your tribe and you stick together. So they were just my friends. You know, what's next for James Bland? What are you, what are you doing from here? Do you have anything that's yeah, gonna share with us? Yeah, a few things, man. I don't like uh, I I got a documentary. Um uh, I got uh um another scripted show that I've been working on. Uh I, I'm kind of now in this place where I'm doing less of the 
like independent um, filmmaking where I'm out hustling, trying to raise the money and going and shooting it on like a shoestring budget and just trying to self-distribute. I, I've done that. I did it with Giants. I've done it with a handful of other projects. I'm now at that place where I'm fortunate enough because of Giants where I can get in the room and I can pitch and I can pitch to the networks and production companies who have the budget to put, you know, millions of dollars behind these projects. And so I'm going that route now. The only thing about that route is it can take a lot longer for the project to get made because there's so many steps and approvals that you got to go through. Um, but it's worth the wait because you got to advance. And I've done the, the low budget, you know, series. I want to do a big budget series next. I want to do something with, you know, some, some serious cash and production value behind it. And so I got a few things um, going on, but nothing I can really announce right now, like nothing that's, uh, that has like a, like a premiere date. <laughs> so um, I got some stuff coming, man. I stay pretty busy. For any of the students, you know, that are watching this today, students or young professionals that are watching this today, um, mm -hmm. that are thinking about a career in the entertainment industry, mm -hmm. would you encourage that or discourage that? Well, I absolutely encourage it. Yeah, if this is what you want to do, if this is where your heart and your passion is, why not do it? I mean, um, there's a lot of money to be made. Uh, and I think we need more filmmakers of color. We need more people in front of the camera and behind the camera. We need more Black executives. We need more Black casting directors. And I think that would be my thing is I would encourage um, people who want to work in this business to not just think about the high profile or the most visible jobs. There are a ton of jobs out there that we need more, you know, black faces in, uh, whether it's like production designers or costume designers or set decorators, you know, uh, definitely more uh, black agents and black managers and uh, black executives because somebody has to green light and body show. Somebody has to pitch, you know, the artists to get it uh, to the studios. And so um, I would encourage as many as many folks who really want to do this to pursue it because it's worthwhile. It's a, it's a good, um, it's, it's, it's fulfilling. I'll say that I, I have zero regrets, you know, on my end. So. And I was just about to ask you too, um, looking back, was there anything at all you would have changed about your journey or, um, and I don't even mean in the sense of, you know, like, no, oh, like sure. I regret doing something just like if yeah. I had known that this route was available to me, would I have gone that way? Nah, for sure. Um, I used to always uh, regret not going to film school. I used to think that I would perhaps be further along in my career if I had gone, or I would be better, <laughs> just to be keep it 100. Maybe I would be a, a better actor. Maybe I would be a better director if I had gone to Juilliard or NYU or even you know USC, but I did. And so I can't really think about what, what, what could have been. I just got to focus on how do I become the best actor I can be today or the best director, or the best writer I can be. And then I also recognize the, um, like the benefit that going to FAMU and going to business school really served in my journey because uh, not, you know, I, I, could, I could be the best artist, but a lot of artists can't get a project financed. A lot of artists can't like uh, put a, a, a show together the way I was able to put together and really find an audience and find a, a to find a platform to distribute it and i know that those skill sets came from going to the family you know pledging alpha being in student government you know how it is at an hbcu you know how our hustle is different you know we the way we compete is different um just our grind is is, is just like they say the school of hard knocks and so i appreciate those experiences that I got at FAMU, but also those business skills in terms of being able to look at things from, you know, a business mindset and figuring out how to put a, you know, a marketing plan together, a business plan together so I can go out and really sell this project. And so, um, but if I had to, if I had to name one, like one thing I would do differently, I would, I would have leaned into my authenticity a lot sooner. I think, you know, one piece of advice I can give is like figure out the thing that makes you special and lean into it. And sometimes the thing that makes us special are oftentimes our insecurities. You know, like you might be insecure about where you come from or about your sexuality 
or about, let's say, your height or your size, like, let's say, you know, um, you're a big girl or just whatever that might be, the thing that you might be like, uh, I don't really know if Hollywood gonna fuck with it. Uh, it's, often th- it's often the thing that's gonna set you apart and it's gonna get you further. So, um, like, the minute I started talking about my queerness was the minute I started, like, even from Giants to even, you know, uh, the types of projects that I'm making now and the opportunities that I'm getting because people want that voice. Um, you look at Issa Rae, her leaning into her awkwardness, being like, I'm an awkward black girl, you know? Um, and so I wish I had learned that lesson sooner, uh, but, you know, here I am. One big thing about Giants that kind of separates it, in my mind at least, from a lot of other shows is kind of how real it is in the sense that yeah. we talk about sexuality, we talk about just mental health. And those are themes that, you know, we often see in shows, but they're kind of fabricated or they're like, oh, it's gotta be this way. Whereas Giants, I felt like it kept it real to me. It felt like I was being told a message, I guess you could say. Yeah, um, just like, it's just all right to be yourself. It's all right to be cool. Like we all want both this stuff. Um, so I, I just think that was super dope. And to add on to another point you mentioned too, um, just about kind of coming out to LA and having that business acumen. Um, I know like, I think a big thing a lot of people don't realize is that you can really, you know, have any background and then come and do this. Mm-hmm. Like yeah. there's yeah. an aspect of everything in filmmaking. Filmmaking is an art mm-hmm. of literally everything. So mm-hmm. I think it's super cool to hear you talk about how that business side of things helped you out in the production of your show. For sure, man. Yeah. It's a pleasure. Um, it's been a great opportunity to sit down and talk with you today, James. Um, and I'm looking forward to our past crossing again in the future. Yeah, most definitely.